All right. So thank you so much for coming to this webinar. My name is Dr. Jess Roberts. I am the Director of Habitat Connectivity here at WOW Virginia. And this is the first of hopefully many webinars going over our brand new Habitat Connectivity Hub for Virginia. So this is sort of the 101, the introduction to the hub, and we're gonna go over lots of the basics. And then in the future, we're hoping to do much more webinars on how to get into the nitty gritty of each part. So the way it's going to work today is we are going to go over um, the basics of different parts of the hub and kind of just generally what you're going to find. So Kylie is going to send you in the chat the link to the Habitat Connectivity Hub. So if you want to, you can look at it as we're going over different parts and follow along if you want. And so there it is in the chat for you. So please do check it out if you haven't already. All right. So I am going to share my screen. All right. Okie dokie. Can everybody see my screen? Okay. Okay. So the way we are going to do this, oops, something happened with my PowerPoint. There we are. Is I'm going to give you guys a brief presentation around 40-ish minutes, and then we're going to save time at the end for any questions that you have. But do feel free throughout the entire webinar, if you have questions, you are more than welcome to put it in the Q&A section. So please do try to put your questions in the Q&A section, not the chat. So, and you can put your questions in that Q&A section at any time during the webinar, and then we will go through them at the end of the webinar. Okay. So once again, welcome to the Virginia Habitat Connectivity Hub 101 webinar. We are very, very excited to be here to show you this brand new hub that we recently um, published this past December. Okay, so briefly, with the hub, we are going to go over why did we make the hub, and then we're going to go into what kind of information we can find on the hub. I'm also going to go through kind of what the basic structure of the hub is <laughs> and how to navigate it. And then we're going to have one slide where what's next, what we're thinking about for the future with this hub, and also a time for you to give us some feedback on the hub as well so we can improve it so you can use it as readily as possible. So. Okay. First things first, why did we make this hub? So I'm going to go over some basic statistics of some things happening specifically for Virginia in terms of biodiversity and wildlife vehicle conflict. So first of all, Virginia drivers crashed into a ton of wild creatures, over 80,000 in 2022. It's quite a bit. So that includes both small and large wildlife. Virginia is the ninth highest state for animal vehicle conflict in um, the United States. So um, we are top 10 in the nation for this. We Our wildlife is constantly interacting with vehicles, and which is very deadly for both wildlife and people in Virginia, and also very costly. Deer vehicle collisions alone in Virginia cost us about $250 million a year. This is including state and personal costs. Black bear collisions, unfortunately, are also on the rise. And also, elk vehicle collisions are on the rise. So we have a lovely reintroduced population of elk in southwest Virginia, and we don't have the infrastructure in place to deal with any kind of elk vehicle conflict quite yet. And so, and these collisions are much more expensive and potentially deadly, because you can imagine elk are much larger. So this is quite the issue in Virginia. 
However, we've been doing quite a lot while Virginia and all of our really wonderful partners eh, to try to get some kind of mitigation happening in place for this wildlife fugal conflict and to enhance our biodiversity. So first of all, in 2020, we had legislation passed by the state to create what's called the Wildlife Corridor Action Plan, where a bunch of state agencies like our Department of Wildlife Resources and Department of Transportation have to come together and create this action plan so we can deal with this wildlife vehicle conflict. In 2021, we also made legislation that is directing these same state agencies to include corridors and recommendations um, based off of what came out of the Wildlife Corridor Action Plan into any sort of their planning, which is very helpful. Then the first version of the Wildlife Corridor Action Plan was published in 2023. So just this past year, this past May, really, really wonderful. So we have sort of the first um, iteration of how to deal with this wildlife vehicle conflict and enhance the biodiversity in our state. And then really wonderful, actually, in this just like two-ish months ago, um, our Virginia Department of Transportation won one of the very first federal grants from what was called the Wildlife Crossing Pilot Program um, to advance more of the priorities of this action plan. So we're going to see that happening um, starting this year due to this federal funding, which is really wonderful. So we've had some large steps. So I wanted to go over a little bit of what um, the goals of the Wildlife Corridor Action Plan for Virginia are because they have to do with our lovely hub. So first of all, we want to identify corridors and high quality habitat that where most of the wildlife are sort of using to travel and use for their habitat. So we want to identify high quality habitats. We want to then identify the human barriers to this movement and to this habitat, so any gaps, so any gaps in corridors that may be improved. Then, of course, we want to identify high areas of what we call WVC, which is wildlife vehicle conflict, so any negative interaction between wildlife and vehicles. So we want to identify in Virginia where the, the highest volume of that is. And then based off of this information of high biodiversity um, highly used corridors and high vehicle conflict, where are they overlapping so we can have um, crossings and corridors put in place to have the most impact. Provide a public portal to host this plan, the data and the maps, and update the plan every four years. So a little bit of the idea coming from this hub is that one of the goals of the Wildlife Corridor Action Plan was to provide some kind of public portal. Now, the state agencies may do their own eventually, which has more a little bit more of the technical data, but we wanted to get a little bit ahead of that so we can start giving really wonderful information to the public ahead of the action plan so you can also advocate for programs in your area. Um, and also, it's going to include information from not only our state agencies. So this is one of the reasons why we wanted to create this hub. The second reason is from something called the Virginia Save Wildlife Corridors Collaborative, or how we finally call it, VISWIC. So below VISWIC, and these organizations are just examples of the organizations that make up this collaborative. We have about 50 organizations that now make up this collaborative. And so an example are state agencies like our DWR, Department of Wildlife Resources, our Virginia Transportation Research Council under the Virginia Department of Transportation, some universities, and lots and lots of really wonderful nonprofit organizations doing really cool conservation research and some connectivity research across the state. So this is our collaborative that we have been working um, on for the past couple of years. So Wild Virginia has been helping co-found and co-lead this collaborative. And what's come out of this is really just a wide variety of wonderful information and data, because really the point of this collaborative was to share resources, share data, and to really look more in depth at wildlife vehicle conflict and habitat connectivity throughout the state. So we can be more of a unified collaborative going forward with any projects but, so that's really wonderful. We have this collaborative, we have this wealth of knowledge, but where do we find it all? 
right? So it's coming from a very diverse amount of organizations, but it, it's kind of confusing on where we go to find the accomplishments of these organizations. Um, you know, they're going to be on lots of different websites. They're going to be on state agency sites. How can the public find these, um, these tools and this information? And then what does it mean? So a lot of these organizations are a little bit more technical and they are very scientific, sometimes organizations. So some of their language can be not so accessible for everyone. And so we wanted to make sure that all of the connectivity information in Virginia is as transparent and as accessible for anyone. And then how can we find the information for my area? So a lot of the information that we're gonna see on the hub are specific tools, but so how do we use those tools to find information specifically for my area? And then also it's just a method we wanted for this hub to highlight a lot of our partners' accomplishments because they are really doing incredible work. And from the statistics we saw at the beginning of this PowerPoint, was, you know, Virginia has a lot of wildlife vehicle conflict and we have lots of bio wonderful biodiversity. Um, but we want to let you know that there is something being done about this conflict and we are trying to solve a lot of the issues we have here in Virginia. So we wanted to highlight a lot of the really wonderful work that our partners are doing. So because we have this wildlife corridor action plan and we have all of this, this wonderful, collaborative with all this really wonderful data, but we wanted to put it in one place and we wanted to make it as accessible and again, transparent as possible. So anyone can use it for one, for finding out information specifically for your area and also how you can advocate for getting better connectivity projects in your area. So that is really the background of how we came to decide on making this hub. And now, we're going to go into a little bit on how to use this hub. So wait one second. Okay. Just wanna make sure I am staying on time. Okay. <clears throat> so the way we organized our hub, we gave you the link in the chat. So again, feel free to follow along. I am going to go back and forth between the PowerPoint and the hub to give you an explanation of everything we're gonna go for so you can see it actually live. So the way we organized it, this is the the what you see when you immediately go to the hub. And you can see down here, we have this sort of um, bar that shows different topics. And so this is how we organized the hub from statewide and county initiatives to specific wildlife crossings, corridors, and aquatic connectivity, and any additional resources. So you can find information this way if you'd like. Um, we organized it this way because, well, there's just a wealth of information out there about habitat connectivity in Virginia. And we were having a little bit of an interesting time on how to organize this to make this as easily um, usable for you. So we are still very much so in um, able to edit this hub. So if we're finding that people are having a difficult time finding certain information, we are very much so in the process of editing it to make it as user-friendly as possible. But for currently, this is how we are organizing it. So what information can you find on the hub? I wanted to make this hub really about anything related to habitat connectivity and as holistic as possible. It's a complicated issue and it requires a lot of knowledge. So if we want to get a project in place that helps reduce wildlife vehicle conflict or enhances biodiversity, both includes environmental justice, we have to include lots of different areas to make the project as impactful and as beneficial and as sustainable as possible. So the types of information we can find on the hub are wildlife vehicle conflict information. So you can look up specifically wildlife vehicle conflict information for your area, or you can look statewide. Same thing with biodiversity. We can look at where the wildlife corridors are mapped in Virginia, and you can look to see where they are in your area as well. We also included a section on environmental justice. Connectivity has a lot of impacts for environmental justice. And if we have a lot of fragmented habitats in areas 
that are very underserved, putting a project in place that enhances the connectivity and the green spaces in those areas is very, very beneficial. Then any kind of mitigation um, efforts for wildlife vehicle conflicts. So again, we wanted to show and highlight some of our wonderful partner projects that are trying to solve these issues in our state and some of the research that comes out of that. What impact are these mitigation efforts having? Land ownership. So we're gonna go into why this is so important for um, corridors and crossings and aquatic connectivity as well, because we can use that really in tandem with terrestrial connectivity. And of course, infrastructure conditions. So we wanna see, you know, what do our culverts, what do our underpasses look like in terms of connectivity? So we wanted to include all of this information to make sure um, that you have as much information as possible. So please do remember as we're going through these topics, all of these topics are related to each other. They all have an impact on each other and they're all important for the cause of increased habitat connectivity. Okay, so first things first, we are going to go over wildlife vehicle conflict and biodiversity. We're gonna go over one example of how you can find different information using the hub. Um, so first, before we go to the actual hub, for wildlife vehicle conflict and biodiversity, we have lots of statewide tools that you can use to look at the statewide impact. And also you can zoom in and look at local sort of impact of wildlife vehicle conflict and biodiversity. A lot of the times we are providing you with actual tools that are embedded in the hub that will help you um, direct you to this type of information. We are trying to highlight the important statistics that come from this data and this mapping. So we always try in our wording to highlight the really important statistics so you have those facts available to you. And then we're usually always going to provide you with some kind of basic, basic explanation on what's happening with this data, where did it come from, and how do you use the tool? So give me a minute right here. All right. Can everybody see the hub? You good? Yeah, I can see it. Thank you, Kylie. Great. So everybody can see our hub. So I scrolled down a little bit, but here is our beautiful hub. Here are our lovely tabs that we were talking about in the beginning where we can sort of jump to a certain initiative or topic. Brief introduction to the hub, talking about how we're using this platform, which is called ArcGIS Story Map. And it's a really wonderful platform for this data because it is really e user friendly and helps us um, showcase a lot of diverse types of data like spatial data, which we have a lot of for habitat connectivity. So going down after we do a brief introduction and we do some brief overview of terminology throughout the hub we start to go into statewide initiatives. And so I'm just gonna highlight this one, but you can peruse the other ones. So this is our wildlife corridor action plan, which I kind of already went over, um, goes into the basics of how it came about. Um, usually for each section, I try to give you some questions of what information you can find in this section. So for instance, for WCAP, you can find um, where can I find information on high wildlife vehicle conflict in my area? So that type of question and that information you can find in this section. And I try to do that for most of these sections to kind of give you a little bit of a reference. I'm not going to go over all of these, but we break down usually with really complex tools and information how they came about, the data that they have, and what it basically tells you. So they always have manuals and these beautiful, really lovely technical outlines of how they got to this data and how they got to these maps. Um, I tried to break it down a little bit more in layman's terms to, so you, sh you can see how they specifically got this data and what this data actually means. So these are biodiversity resilience corridors in Virginia. So this, these are areas where wildlife, high wildlife traffic. So wildlife tend to peruse these corridors quite a bit. Again, just showing you visuals and a breakdown of how they got to the data and what core and corridor means. So I'm, I'm not going to go over it because we don't have enough time. But um, these are short paragraphs on just the basics of what you can find um, and what these definitions really mean. Same thing with our natural land network, which is our corridors. 
and then how they got into high wildlife vehicle conflict in um, their area. So how they found these hotspots of this wildlife vehicle conflict. And then really important, this is the best um, um, image that comes out of this is these nexus areas. So the areas where these biodiversity resilience corridors overlap with high vehicle conflict, where potentially a crossing or a corridor would have the most impact in terms of reducing this conflict, enhancing biodiversity. So they have these nexus areas, um, they're, they're 25 square mile areas around these biodiversity and high vehicle conflict. So we give a breakdown of how they got to this information and what it means. In addition to this, the Department of Con <clears throat> Conservation and Recreation is the one who um, houses this really wonderful tool that showcases this data. So we just saw the breakdown of what this data means, how they got it. Now we're going into the actual tool where you can see this data up close and specifically go to your area. So I always provide brief instructions on how to use this specific tool. Here we have the link to the tool. It takes you directly to the map. And based off of the instructions I gave you in the hub, you can kind of fool around with the data. So I went right to the Wildlife Quarter Action Plan. And here we are. This is that same image that we just saw. Just this is manipulation type of data. We can zoom in to specific areas. We can click specific things to find more information about them. Here's a nexus area. We can see areas of high vehicle conflict. So these are specific ways that we can use um, this hub. Sorry, I just have to get back to the actual hub here. There we go. OK, so again, we provide the basics of what you can find. What the information means, we can always give you, if they have it, a tool. We give you basic instructions on how to find the information on the tool. And then we're either providing you the link to the tool, like here, or we embed it in the actual hub itself, which I'm going to show you in just a second. And then if there is any additional resources or any connection to any other parts of the hub, we always highlight that as well. So you can use this data that we just went over on the Wildlife Quarter Action Plan in tandem with this tool right here that showcases land ownership. And we describe how that helps with habitat connectivity. And then here we show you that we have the manual, direct link to the manual for using this tool and more in depth and also a video that DCR did on how to use this data and how to use this tool. So we always give you the basic information. We give you the tool, if there is one, how to use it, extra resources, and how it can connect to other places in the hub. So this is an example of how you see a tool and a link to the tool. But this next section is showing the Virginia Department of Transportation's carcass removal data. The tool is actually embedded in the hub, so it'll tell you to click anywhere to interact, and you can immediately start using this tool right in the hub. You can start interacting, finding different types of data, and we give instructions again on how to, basic instructions on how to use this tool for your needs. And these tools are linked directly to their original location. So they are always up to date because they are linked directly with the original location. So any tool that is actually embedded in the hub comes from its original location and will be updated um, repeatedly with the actual source of the data. Again, basic instructions and basic kind of questions of what you can find in each tool. So let me go back to the PowerPoint real fast. Okay. There we go. Okay, so we saw a really great introduction onto wildlife vehicle conflict and biodiversity and give you what you basically can find with each topic of the hub. So now moving on to mitigation. So wildlife vehicle conflict mitigation, we gave examples of crossings for all types of wildlife, large and small, that are happening in the state. Um, so their current crossings we give examples of and also potential crossings. So research on where we can put potential crossings to deal with conflict and to deal with the enhancement of the biodiversity. And then also a lot of research on the impact of these crossings. 
Um, so the use of wildlife by these crossings and what their impact on wildlife fuel conflict is. So we give a lot of really wonderful research being done on those topics as well. We give um, specific crossing projects, but then there are lots of county-based research on where potential crossings can go for Loudoun and Albemarle County specifically. And then of course, for each, each project, we always link full studies and the more resources for that project. So I'm gonna give you an example and just let's switch back over. So we go up here to our wildlife crossings research. We hit that tab and we go right to that section. We see a lovely little video of a bear that I paused for a second just because I think my computer's freaking out. Um, but you would be able to see this bar, a bear using this lovely crossing. Um, and I am going to highlight, I'm going to go down to one of the, oh, actually, I'll do this one. So this is one example of existing underpasses that are used for wildlife. And this comes from the wonderful VDOT, Virginia Transportation Research Council. So we give, it's not showing up right now, but this would be um, a map of where, location of where these crossings are. Gives a description of um, their dimensions, basically, and how they're built specifically for wildlife. And we give some camera trap images of wildlife using the data. So we can see here that these crossings were specifically made for um, uh, wildlife to use because they have these grates above them. So we sort of explain that and we give benefic be the benefits of using the certain size of these crossings compared to other types of sizes and of crossings. So we can just see a basic description <laughs> of the use of these underpasses by wildlife and the really important statistics that comes along. So you can use this information to say, hey, the Virginia Department of Transportation said that this is probably a more beneficial underpass for all types of wildlife to use. We give you that information so then you can use it in future advocacy. We always link to the report at the end or somewhere within, if not repeatedly throughout the description of each project. So I'm just gonna, these are some other ones. I'm just gonna go down a little bit. This is an example of a really cute one. If you haven't seen it already, these are salamander wildlife road tunnels that have um, already been built and you can get a description of them. So we really wanted to highlight this connectivity for all different types of wildlife. This is a great example of it. So you can read about these guys. And again, we're giving contacts so you can find out more information from partners um, and anything else that would be helpful for you to find more information. So I'm just gonna um, scoot down a little bit. We also make sure that we highlight really important statistics that come out of research from the use of crossings. So this is one that's coming from the Virginia Transportation Research Council again saying that after they added fencing to existing underpasses, they reduced deer vehicle conflict by 96% in some areas. So really, really, really good statistics we're trying to give you at the forefront. Um, and then if you wanna read the rest of the research article, we always, again, provide them for you. This is an example of a potential wildlife crossing that may happen. So you can read about this for our lovely elk in Southwest. And then I just real fast wanted to highlight some of our really wonderful county initiatives. So Loudoun County and Albemarle County have been doing a lot of really wonderful habitat connectivity research. I'm going to highlight Loudoun County real fast right here. This is done <clears throat> in Loudoun County because they have actually the highest deer vehicle conflict in the state, Loudoun County does. And so it was such motivation for DWR, the Department of Wildlife Resources, and William and Mary to create a partnership to try to find areas that have existing underpasses to use for potential wildlife crossing and enhance it with the addition of fencing to reduce this conflict in Loudoun County. And they did such an amazing job. I definitely recommend um, reading over the basics of this project and going through their report because this is something that hopefully in the future we'd love to replicate somehow. Uh, but it gives the basics of the project, a little bit of their results that come out of it. So they have high ranking crossing potentials. And then we also, so it's being a little crazy right now. I'm just gonna, because I've been using the hub. So what we did here was in addition to the map, there we go. 
we created an interactive map that goes along with their data. So we can explain more thoroughly how they came about their areas of high vehicle conflict and where the most impactful crossings would be. So we have this really interactive, lovely data that as you go along with the story, it'll zoom in on specific areas and you can see the link to the actual page of their full report on how they came about, like, why is this the number one area where we should be putting fencing and underpasses to deal with this conflict. And we always link to the full report that you can get it. And we give examples of what is the information that's in their report that you can quickly click onto. And we did that for the first two priority areas just to kind of give you an example of what that looks like in the report. So that's a really cool example of some county-based research. Um, and then we also had a citizen science initiative that we directly embedded it into the hub. This is another tool you can use. This is live data coming in constantly. So they have volunteers going out and recording um, wildlife vehicle conflict on the roads in Loudoun County. And they're actually spatially putting them into this map right here. So you can, um, depending on the day, you know, it might be 320 observations now, but tomorrow it might be 500. So they're doing quite a lot of really wonderful work. So you can easily use this tool within our hub. And again, it's updated with their updates. Um, and you can get more intense information. And we also give lots of information on how you can join these citizen science initiatives and who to contact for more information. So really good example of some more local and some more um, county-based initiatives for wildlife vehicle conflict that are just incredible. And I definitely highly recommend you check out. Okay. So again, you can kind of peruse all the different types of crossings that we included information on it and the research. And then of course, we always provide the links to the actual reports or any other types of more information and any contact details for anybody who's leading that project if you need to know more information. Going into corridors and land ownership. So the last two topics of the hub are corridors, land ownership, and then aquatic connectivity. So first, corridors and land ownership. We wanted to give you the tools to see statewide where all the different types of parcels of land and who owns them and how they're connected. Um, so, and we have multiple different types of tools that help us do that, which I'll show you in just a second. For existing corridors, so areas where wildlife um, uses for movement or simply just uses for their territory and their habitat, um, so we have tools to show existing land ownership and existing corridors. And also we have a tool for showing where the most impact for putting maybe a conservation easement to increase a corridor in the future. So this is really helping us where we can um, view corridors as an alternative for crossings to reduce wildlife fuel conflict. So for instance, if we cannot um, create an underpass or an overpass over some kind of road to reduce that wildlife vehicle conflict. Perhaps nearby, we have two parcels of land and we can create a conservation easement between them. So some natural land habitat corridor, connected habitat between them, where maybe we can direct wildlife to use those corridors instead of trying to cross the highway. So they can sort of be a um, substitute in some ways for these crossings. But, um, and they can also, we can see where maybe if we input a crossing, so maybe an overpass or an underpass over a highway to connect two areas of really high value land or protected lands. So this is for a different aspect of habitat connectivity, but as you can see, it's very connected to all the previous topics we talked about. So I'm gonna show you the brief, really briefly that section so we go straight to corridors. The first one is also a tool from the Department of Conservation and Recreation. We have it directly embedded it in the hub. So thank you so much to DCR for that. You can click and you can interact with it. And 
We can click certain areas on the map. They're already labeled for us as well on what a specific parcel of land and what the land ownership is. We can also look for areas um, like for instance, let's try to find one. Sorry, I think my computer's freaking out a little bit with all the technical stuff going on. But for instance, Maybe we can look right here. We have two pretty high value habitats. Maybe we can look for more areas of land right here to connect. Maybe more areas for more conservation e easements to have a more solid corridor that wildlife can use to go between these habitats. Very important for conservation because it prevents our species from becoming isolated, which is bad genetically and also just bad in terms of competition and resource use. So it's really helpful to have connections between high value habitats, especially so we can use these tools for that purpose. Again, we give a brief overview of what the tool is, the link to the tool again, even though it's embedded in the hub, we like to give the links more of a map of it. And again, we give a little bit of an overview of how to use this tool and also in conjunction with other things on the hub, like our wildlife corridor action plan data, we can use it in conjunction. Um, and it goes over a little bit briefly about why this is important. Again, all the stuff we talked about connecting habitats is very, very important. And then we also have a section on potential um, corridors, which our lovely Valley, uh, Valley Conservation Council has done for us. This is another interactive map where we can look at each project. They go over an overview of where these conservation easements might be really beneficial to connect to high value habitats. Um, and they go through multiple projects. So you can see all different areas of where we potentially could use some conservation easements to create these corridors for more increased habitat connectivity. And they also go over a little bit of crossings too, if they cross a road. So some really cool tools to see where we can see some potential. Orders. And then finally, we have um, aquatic connectivity and infrastructure. So aquatic and terrestrial organism passage can be maximized if we combine them. So for instance, something using something like a culvert. So right here, this tiny little picture is an image of a culvert. So <clears throat> We can enhance this culvert to provide more aquatic passage. So you can see here how it's a little elevated of a culvert. So probably a fish or, you know, an organism can't really use this culvert unless it's flooding. Um, and maybe it's a little small of a culvert and a little dark. So maybe our terrestrial, you know, a deer or a bear maybe won't use this because it's too dark and it's too small. So we can enhance these culverts and this infrastructure for better aquatic and better terrestrial passage. That's why we include aquatic tools to help us do both of those. Um, it's also good for flood resilience. Um, so this is something we need to talk more about of like climate change and what we need to do about this. We can improve our infrastructure, not only for connectivity, but it can have a positive impact on flood resilience. This makes the infrastructure more long lasting and we can do endangered species habitat enhancement. So we gave you two tools that look into this, and I'm going to show you. So we go to Aquatic Organism Passage. We give a little bit of an overview of why it's really important to include both aquatic and a terrestrial habitat together. We start off with giving you a link to the very first tool. We go over what is involved in the tool, we give you an example of another culvert here. This one has a little bit better of terrestrial and aquatic connectivity. <clears throat> we always give you the base, the instructions to use these tools. These are a little bit more of technical tools. So we give you the basic information of what you can find using these tools and how to use them. These are very complex tools and they give us a lot of information. So we try to break it down for you on terms of like, if you have a specific project that you want to prioritize or you know of a culvert in your area and you wanna check these databases for its ranking in terms of, um, you know, for instance, they do, do, do 
how many miles of stream would be restored if you removed or improved this barrier? Or what percentage of natural landscape in is included upstream of this barrier? You know, all different types of data that you can use to know more about the specific culverts and infrastructure in your area. So there's this tool. And then we also have another embedded tool. This is a different one. So this one up here is called SARP. This is a national tool. So this is gonna give you lots of information on habitat connectivity nationally, but you can zoom in to Virginia with the tool and sp find specific information for Virginia that way, but it is a national tool. This one is a Chesapeake watershed tool specifically. So only for the Chesapeake Bay watershed and gives a little bit more information on specific endangered or threatened species, but you can click culverts only. So you can see the culverts, we can zoom in and you can click a culvert to see its ranking. Um, red is usually means that it doesn't provide really that much habitat quality and it's actually pretty bad for the area. And then blue, lighter um, or darker blue colors say that they're pretty good um, infrastructure or pretty good culverts in terms of how much connectivity they provide. They give a very specific ranking system that we actually give you instructions for and what kind of information that you can find within each one. I'm not going to go over it because it's very, very technical. This is for a more in-depth webinar in the future, but we give you the basic instructions on what you can find on them, how you find your specific culvert information in your area. And also, if there is not a culvert on there that you know of in your area, these tools allow you, we provide the information on how you can connect with someone so you can get your culvert listed. So really, really good tools. We also provide always more links to the reports and any more information on how to use the tool specifically. And then finally, we have just a section for additional resources. So just additional reading material that you can find on the hub and we're always looking for more so it will change and be increased throughout time. And then, so for the last part of this, what's up next? So we got, as I said before, we got federal funding to start prioritizing more of these crossings um, in the future to reduce this wildlife vehicle conflict. So that's where that federal funding is going to prioritize these projects. And currently right now, Wild Virginia and a lot of our nonprofit partners are trying to advocate and lobby for the creation of a state wildlife corridor grant fund, which will provide state and private funding to these corridor and crossing projects to get them put in place. So a lot of the stuff that we saw on the hub today, we wanna to get them put in place. We're trying to get the money for it. And that is what Senate Bill 455 is doing. So please do um, uh, follow Wall of Virginia, get on our listserv so you can be updated on our action alerts on how to advocate for Senate Bill 455 and really look up the information on this. We're always doing that. That's happening right now. We're trying to advocate for this. Um, it passed the Senate. It's going on to the House soon. So our job isn't done. Please, um, again, link up with Wild Virginia so we can add you to our um, advocacy efforts. We also want to enhance this hub. So we want to make it more user-friendly if possible. We want to always add more information as uh, new information comes in. We potentially would love to create a database where we combine all of this spatial data into one, um, but the state agencies may already be doing this. So that's a little bit <clears throat> um, on the fence right now of whether or not that will happen, but we're, we're, all, we're gonna really try to make this information as available and usable for you in the future. And we're gonna do more webinars. So we're gonna do more webinars in the future that goes in specific areas within the hub. So you can learn about each tool more in depth and how to use that for advocacy purposes. Um, and so we wanna know how we can improve. So Kylie is going to provide you with a link to a survey that we created. So please do give us feedback on this webinar and our hub in general so we can improve. All right.
So thank you so much. Um, I am going to look at questions right now and take some questions. Where is my Q&A? It's here somewhere. There we are. Okay, it looks like we don't have too many questions as of right now. So I am going to look into them. Okay. We have another one. Could you clarify what makes it a hub? In other words, is this bringing together um, the WCAP info from DCR, DW, VDOT, and others? Yes. So it's kind of just a creative word that we wanted to use. We wanted to make it the one-stop shop for habitat connectivity information in Virginia. So it's kind of this hub, this place where you go to really find out anything, whether it come from state agencies or it come from nonprofits or a combination. Um, we wanted to make sure it have this centralized location for all of this data. And we wanted to come up with a clever name for it. So hub was the best name that we came up with because it's this centralized location. Okay. Is there a possible citizen science aspect to this maybe monitoring roadkill? Yeah, for sure. So um, there's multiple different types of this. The the roadkill for the state that VDOT is doing is only through um, contractors. So they're the only ones who have access to that app. That's not a citizen science initiative. But for instance, Loudoun County, um, if you go to county initiatives and you go to that first one, that Loudoun County, the last part of that is a citizen science initiative. And we provide the contact information of who you contact if you wanna get involved with that. Um, in terms of doing citizen science initiatives uh, for other counties, there was an Albemarle one, um, but it's a little bit on hold right now. And in the future, we'd love to do it in different areas. That's just not set up at the moment. But the Loudoun County one is set up. It's currently happening if you'd like to contribute to that one. OK. All right. Do, do, do. Let's see. If we get a couple, is there an easement in my area, a large one off of Rockfish Road? What does that allow and how does that benefit wildlife? Also, um, one can call VDOT directly for carcass removal. Yeah, that's true also. Yeah, for sure. So you can do that as well um, for carcass removal. It's just in terms of how it gets directed to a tool where you can see wildlife vehicle conflict is still in um, the beginning stages. So we give the tool that VDOT is currently using that you can see currently right now. So if that contractor is a part of that plan and they get the call to pick up that carcass, then it will be reported on the tool that we have the hub. It's just not a statewide tool just yet, but um, cause it's a pilot program, but it will be in the future. Um, da -da 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 -da. So there's different types of easements um, also. So you can find more information on easements on two of our tools. So you can go to the corridor section, you can go to DCR, or you can go to Valley Conservation Council. They all give really good definitions of what go is going on with um, easements. And there's lots of different types of them. Um, for instance, you can have agricultural easement. Um, but generally, they are conservation easements. They have certain regulations on what you can do on the property um, and what kind of benefits you can get from that. Um, and so using our tools under corridors, you can see where those easements are and see um, you can click. So if you can find that easement that you were talking about, um, you can click on that little spatial blob or whatever it looks like, and it'll give you all the information of that easement so you can look it up. Um, we got a couple. Others, I think, in the chat. Is there more to be done on the hub? What does the future hold? What will Wild VA continue to take the lead? So, um, so we're dealing with um, a bunch of legislation right now. So Senate Bill 455, definitely recommend looking that up. And um, for the hub specifically, um, it will be continuously updated based off of partner information with the best and most up-to-date available information. Potentially in the future, it just depends on what state agencies do. If state agencies create some kind of spatial tool that combines um, wildlife fuel conflict, biodiversity stuff, aquatic connectivity, infrastructure, corridors, if it combines all of that on one of their sites, we won't really need to do too much 
um, in terms of more scientific type of data, they will be doing it. If they don't um, end up doing it, we here at Wild Virginia would love to take that next step and try to combine all these data sources into one, into a more spatial um, database for people to use. So that depends on a lot of things happening in the future. Um, yeah, a lot of different moving parts on that one, but we'll see what happens. Um, and then we have another one in the chat. If you're interested in participating in Loud and Wildlife Monitoring Project, please contact Wildlife Crossing VA. So I think she sent that to everyone. So she gives contact information. She is, Chrissy is really helping out with the, um, the citizen science initiative that we have listed on the Loudoun County County Initiative site. So she just gave an email if you want to do the citizen science initiatives in the chat to everyone. So she provided that email. Thank you, Chrissy. Does anybody have any other questions? Just want to make sure I get all of them. Okay, and if you haven't already, please do fill out that survey that we provided in the chat. We will be sending an email out to you later on that also will have the survey on it. So please do let us know of anything else you have um, in terms of how you would like to see the hub improved to make it more easy for you, more transparent, and anything else in terms of, do you have a project that we could add to the hub? Um, and then what types of webinars would you like to see in the future? For instance, would you like to see a webinar all on habit, on aquatic connectivity, a whole webinar on corridors, a whole webinar on using the hub for advocacy, et cetera, et cetera. And we will try to tailor that for you. So please do fill out that survey. Thank you so much for coming. If you have any, any more questions, we are still available for like the next eight minutes. So <laughs> do let me know. <laughs>